All right, we're back, I think. Yes. Hi, Mike. How are you? How, how are you doing? doing? I'm doing well. Good to see you. Hey, Every time, uh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that, you know, here's something that's really interesting and it might be a little controversial. I don't even know what your feelings are on it, but, you know, what's your thought on the law of attraction? Because I have an interesting oh. story today. Oh, I know. I've always believed in that. I don't. So I, I think I did a podcast on this, I don't know, five years ago or something, but the way that I think about it is the universe, we always say the universe and people think of the cosmos and I think more in terms of the universe of your mind and you're going to attract the energy that you create within yourself and the worth you have within yourself. And I don't know anybody who, if they're, so what, what happens, people want to dismiss it. They go, well, the universe, what does that even mean? And uh, I can tell you those people are attracting neg negative people in their lives where me, I, I wake up every day just kind of open, abundant, confident. Right. And I always attract and have all kinds of serendipity in my life. I'll, I'll, tell, you, I'll tell you my weirdest story. You tell me your story first. Okay. I'll tell you my story. So mine, mine is real recent. And, and I, it, years ago, and I'm going back probably 10 plus years, that movie, The Secret, came out or whatever. And then every uh, realtor office in the United States was playing that to their agents and trying to get them to manifest listings and buyers, okay? Doesn't quite work like that because, you know, there's more to it. But anyway, it was really big when that movie came out. But I've recently been reading some of the, uh, the Neville Goddard work. I don't know if you've looked into that over, you know, years ago. He's the guy that 1920s and 30s that kind of put this whole – uh, thesis forward that there's this universal law out there that you know if you imagine something and you know that that constantly reframing 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 situations that you'll manifest this whatever you're thinking about into your life through you know just constant uh, reframing okay which I, I think there's an enormous amount of truth to that because you can take a bad situation, you know, and keep thinking about it, reframing it in a different way. And all of a sudden your mind will start thinking of solutions to that issue. So that that's happened to me many, many, many times in my life and in my career. So I've got this new facility here in the, the Napa airport. Okay. Beautiful place. I'm actually filming from there right now. I've got a sound stage, you know, it's, it's a, uh, concrete walls. It's, you know, huge 20 foot, 25 foot ceilings, a beautiful, beautiful space, right? The one thing that this space doesn't have is air conditioning in the offices upstairs. Okay. Now we have R30 for those contractor folks out there. I've got R30 insulation um, across the entire ceiling of this place. So even when it's like yesterday here in Napa Valley, it got up to about 88, 90 degrees. And it was warm in here, but I think we got up to maybe 74, 76 in here, which starts to get uncomfortable for a work environment, yes. um, especially yeah. when you have employees and stuff. And so, um, and my partner and I have been thinking, well, gee, we need to try it. We got to get air, air conditioning in here. We had a couple bids and we got a guy and it was like $8,000. I'm like, man, it's going to blow our freaking budget for the month, you know, because we, we try to run a, a very tight, you know, budget, we, we budget our items out, what we're going to, you know, CapEx and stuff like that. And I was like, I'm thinking, well, man, I got to bring, you got to figure out how to do this because I need to get the air conditioning in here. Well, lo and behold, just out of nowhere, I have a property that's in contract, hot property, very uh, inexpensive little condo that, you know, it's a wholesale deal. The people decided to back out of the contract and release 3000 I think it was $3,500 uh, to me almost immediately. So the next day, I have another proper, I have two other properties in contract, both wholesale deals, and the seller, or I'm sorry, I'm the seller, the buyer wants to extend escrow. Well, the problem is in this situation, the way escrow works is you put down an earnest money deposit. Well, this guy's got like, I think $38,000 in earnest money down on these two properties that I'm selling him. He was supposed to close two days ago. Couldn't do it. I don't know if it was a loan issue. I don't know. You know, it's supposed to be a cash deal, but so many of these guys, they come in, say they're cash deals, and then lo and behold, they're getting, you know, borrowing money from a hard money lender, a private right. money lender, which we can talk about in some other point, but drives me insane. But anyway, 
the, this guy, I, I kind of have a reputation of, of knowing the contract in my market. I'm like the only guy that knows every freaking line of the contract. I can tell you, hey, 14B only allows you this. There is no, you know, passive uh, contingent or there is a passive contingent contingency release clause in this contract. You're fucked. You know, if you don't close, I'm taking your $38,000. So this guy says, well, hey, how about if I pay you $2,000 a day for the delay? on top of the purchase price. I said, okay, that's fair. That's $4,000, okay? So 4,000 plus 3,500 is 7,500 bucks. My air conditioner is about eight grand, $8,500. Poof, mm -hmm. came out of nowhere. That's just for me thinking about it. I'm thinking to myself, you know, I gotta get this air conditioner. How am I gonna do it? And then boom, the money just shows up. Now I will tell you, this happens numerous, numerous times over my life. And a lot of people say success breeds success which is true, but I, I also think it's kind of a law of attraction thing. Like I, another issue that I had, this is maybe a month ago, um, I had some tax money that I owed. And it was like, I, I think $48,000 or something. And I'm like, oh man, this is really, you know, $48,000. I got this air conditioner, whatever. How am I going to take care of this? And out of nowhere, I get a, a settlement check from some issue that I was dealing with two years ago. And guess how much it was? It was $44,000. Just shy of what I needed to pay off the, uh, the tax thing that was a big thorn in my side, you know, that came out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the IRS comes up, they look at your tax return from two years ago, and they say, hey, we recalculated this. And you know what? You owe us uh, $48,000 extra. Right. And so I'm like, uh, you got to be kidding me. I was just going to buy myself a new car or something. Yeah. <laughs> but then this money just comes out of nowhere, just shows up in the, in, in the uh, mailbox, unexpected. So this stuff happens all the time to me. And it, it usually it's with money because that's what I, I focus on. You know, I focus on monetizing things, making money, and business, and things like that. But, but this particular, the, these are two situations that happened over the past two weeks. And one of them this week. So... I am a firm believer in the law of attraction. I, I do think that you have to put in the effort. You have to do the things that are required. But it's interesting how this stuff just pops up and, and happens in your life. I mean, do you do you see this in your life too with, with things that just outside of money? Well, I, I see it happen um, many, many times in many contexts. And I'm glad that you took a step back on what the law of attraction is or isn't because – there, I just assume people kind of knew and most people had listened. Who listened to this know, but maybe they didn't. So I'm glad uh -huh. you explained that. Yeah, yeah. For me, I, I, I assume that everybody did, but maybe not. And there are all these different ways to look at it. One is if you buy a yellow car, you're suddenly going to drive around the road and say, oh, wow, there's a yellow car. There's a yellow car. Or if you get a Jeep and that isn't really the universe sending yellow cars to you. Right. But, but something that was always there that you never noticed is there all of a sudden. And I use that to explain how I think of the law of attraction is that, I mean, I have really weird beliefs on it, but, I, but I'll just keep it a little normal here, which is if you focus on opportunity and you view yourself as a vehicle for opportunity, when you're out in public, you're just going to see more opportunity. Everywhere you look, you're going to find more opportunity. Or if you're you know, I, I need more money rather than focusing. And I talk about this in my masterclass rather than focusing on the emotional stress of money, which is very stressful. Money problems are very stressful. Yes. You start to focus on how can I find money rather than I need money. How can I find money? And then you start to look around. Oh, uh, well, there's this, there's that. I, I, one example for me is last year, through no fault of my own, I had a financial catastrophe happen. And I'll, I, we've, talked about it recently with a company I started and how they sent me bad inventory and it set the company. Oh, sure. Back and I remember that. Yes. Money into it. It was just really was a catastrophe. There's no other way to put it. And I was like really stressing out about money. And you now you can always tap into home. There's all kinds of ways, but it's not fun. Everybody's got the same problems. They just take different. I was going to have to sell some retirement accounts and then I have to pay taxes and penalties and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so I wasn't. I thought you, got, I, I thought you had a billion dollar like uh, settlement right. from your uh, prior divorce, right? Or, yeah, or exactly. <laughs> all, all the 50,000 a month in alimony that I, but anyway, I just started to think, okay, you need to think more about 
the money, more about how to make money. And I'd gotten lazy too, just because, you know, it was a, you reach a certain level, you lose momentum. And sure. then all of a sudden it started coming from everywhere. And a lot of that though was initiative. I started to, to be more proactive. I saw opportunities or I said, oh well, yeah, why haven't I ever made a master class? So I ended up making a master class and was able to sell enough of those. A lot of people don't even know I have a master class, funnily enough, because I just I did so well out of a couple months of it that I forgot to keep plugging it. Because I because it was mainly to to hit a shortfall. I even I was thinking this is gonna be my next book. You you read about all these historical figures like Ulysses S. Grant, Mark Twain. And when I was younger, I would read articles on how they would go on tours to pay their tax bills. And I thought, Oh, what idiot, you know, <laughs> I'm in that situation now. I'm like, Oh man, now I get it. There's going to be a chapter in my book, pay your taxes, pay them soon, pay them or pay them, pay them too early ra rather than too late. And so it was, it was a well, situation. Or, or, in my, or in my case, you just wait until it shows up in your mailbox. It's just weird check out of nowhere. But um, well, I've had, no, I, I had that where, I had opportunities arise from kind of out of nowhere. And uh, there, there are multiple areas. I do believe in the energetic vibrations. I do yeah. believe that if I'm sending out positive energy, I'm going to get positive energy back. The mistake people make is they expect it to be instantaneous. Um, where I, I view it as, I view it as, don't talk to me about improving your life unless you're willing to put in three years. I'd rather have 10 years, but give me three. People sure. don't want to hear that. So they'll go, oh, I'm meditating on you know, winning the Powerball lottery or something. It's like, no, 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 that isn't really how to it do it. Like, it's like any kind of skill. You become more and more energetic and you learn how to create energy and alchemy and everything. So my favorite law of attraction story of all time is I was in New York having dinner with my wife and I was on my smartphone, even though I probably shouldn't have been, but I don't really care. I'm on my phone all the time and people can judge me for that. And I was reading a Facebook message post by James Altucher. And he was saying how he just had dinner with, I, I forget the guy's name. I think Kamal Ravenkat, he wrote a book on uh, meditations and affirmations. It's a great book. It's called Love Yourself Life, your, Like Your Life Depends On It. And I go, you know, it'd be kind of cool. I'd like to meet James one day. I'd like to meet him one day. Start walking home, go to Union Square. I see this guy with all these curly hair. And I thought, is that James Altucher? No. Yeah, look. Come on. Go, really? James? I said, James, is that you? He goes, Oh, hi, how are you? And it, it was James Altucher playing chess in Union Square in New York. Now, wow. now I was a card carrying member of the Skeptic Society. Before there was an intellectual dark dark web 20 years ago, I knew who Michael Shermer was and everything. So what the skeptic would say was, Well, you live in New York. New York is kind of an epicenter of people. The person wrote a Facebook post how he was in New York. Facebook fed you that out post algorithmically, algorithmically because it knew you checked in to the restaurant and would show that to you. And James Altucher plays chess. Therefore, it would, be, it would make sense that you'd run into him onto because everybody plays chess in Union Square. That would be the way to kind of be dismiss it. The other hand, though, is if you find meaning in synchronicity, then they have meaning. Jung and other people have talked about that. And, yeah. and, and the other, of course, the other hand, too, is I've had way too many stories like that happen for me to, to fall into that, well, it's just a coincidence. I'm like, yeah, if it only happened to me one time, but I've had way too many things where I see people at the airport that I was wanting to talk to or that I was literally wanting to talk to a person, I thought about the person, and then I, I'll see the person. If that happens every now and then, sure, stuff like this happens to me every day. Really weird stuff. Or spooky, as Scott Adams says, all, all the time. And in that regard, I do believe in the law of attraction. And as you become more and more in tune with energy, you avoid a lot, too. A lot of it, too, is avoidance. You, you start to feel what like a bad vibe is. And if you, if you avoid bad vibes, so much in life is avoiding right the really catastrophic mistakes. That's what a lot of people don't appreciate a lot of life is avoiding the bad luck so you can't avoid the bad luck let's say you get cancer you know something like that but your right. mom there, there are certain things you can't avoid but 
so much in life is just avoiding the catastrophic screw ups. Like, you know, if you're out drinking with your bros at three in the morning in certain parts of the town, some idiot's going to get in a bar fight. Somebody's going to get in, get in with a beer bottle and you're there. Guess what? Your life is ruined. You're going to get caught up in that. So much is being caught up in the game. And as you just avoid energetically, this bad vibe. I got a bad feeling. If I get a bad feeling, I just leave. I don't have to explain myself. Eh, bad yeah, vibe. I, well, that, that's interesting you bring that up because there are, you can very much tune your radar, if you will, into those vibes that you're talking about, that, that, that uh, impure energy or there's something out there that you can certainly feel. And I'd love to get a little bit more of your take on that. I think we all have it. It's just as Nietzsche and others have said, our instincts have been suppressed to the point where you have to, so much of the work you put in is rediscovering your instincts. I was, I was writing, for example, how so many men write to me in ways, and, and I'm kind of mean about it. I shouldn't be, and I, I, I'm working on that on myself. You know, We're always working on ourselves, but a lot of us, I just don't relate to people who don't have that raw, primal, animalistic aggression in themselves, right? Mm-hmm. I, don't, I can't relate. To me, I want people to come in and say, I got 15 ideas and I'm grinding every day. But instead of, instead, like most of what I get is, well, how do you stay motivated? Just really pathetic, frankly, kind of stuff. And, but it's so common that this is culture wide. And that's because we, we have been completely put out of touch with our instincts. We need to control our instincts for, you know, if your instinct says, go, you know, this person disrespected you territorially, you know, go, you know, caveman, that guy, no, you shouldn't do that. Right. But most people aren't in touch with their, your instincts will tell you that's a bad person. Avoid that person. Bad vibe. Just get, get away, get away from the situation. Bad vibes. I'm creeped out. Well, you know, even then, like a lot of the men go, oh, women say men are creepy. Yeah, that's, they're in touch with the energy. Just some guy hovering around. I've Because I've had that happen where haters will come where I'm at and they're just like, like hover. And there's a, it's like they're a blob or something. It's this weird, if you could see it, it would be like this gelatinous blob trying to put slime all over you. You can feel it. And th- so that's like the creepy male energy that, that women kind of get because, you know, women, they make a mistake. You know, the guy might try to rape them or something, right? We, right. you know, we get caught up with a guy like that and they'll just ruin your night or something. It's a little bit different. So yeah, men are completely out of touch. With this yeah. Story. And I, I, there's actually a really good point here. I, Mike and I were, were at an event one time, it was probably three or four months ago and it was kind of winding down. And I think there was maybe six of us that were going to go grab something to eat afterwards. And um, we were going to the sushi place, but there was one person that was really just an odd, bizarre almost energy. And it wasn't even what they were saying or necessarily doing. It was just a really weird, odd energy. Do you remember that? And, and it was, and, and, I picked up on it. There were multiple people in the room that picked up on it and nobody could really put their finger on it, but there was definitely something weird there. Right. Yeah. And you have to learn all, all of that is in, all of that is inside of us. We've evolved to get a feeling, but a lot of it is, um, a lot of it is the social kind of what I call the simulation, the social simulation. I'll give you a, uh, I'll give you a good example of that. I was watching a live stream Three guys were in Florida. A couple bigger guys picked a fight with them. And then they walked away. And then they went back to find the big guys. And one of the kids had a gun. And he was essentially peer pressured by his friends to pull out his gun. He ended up getting arrested. That's the short story. The long story is there's, this is a cluster. And these are these really weird live streamers. And why am I watching that when I'm 41 years old? You know, I guess I can find wisdom everywhere. Right. And, as I'm, and as I'm watching that, I'm thinking, you know, this young man just ruined his life, ruined his life. He had one choice, just walk away from these idiots. These two, two other guys are trying to get you to instigate some kind, just walk away from them, just leave them. And I, I thought too about that podcast you and I done and how you have to walk away from friends sometimes. Right. Right. Because th- that can be what happens if you hang around the kind of people who know you have a gun So they're going to try to initiate some kind of aggression to to get you to find some legal loophole because the the people in the video were saying, stand your ground. We don't have to leave. We can stand our ground. We're in Florida. 
no, I'm a lawyer. I have criminal defense lawyers in Florida. That's not how the standard ground law works, right? You don't get to say, you know, you don't get to call a big muscle man a douchebag or something, and then he smacks you, and then you pull out a gun. That, that's not how it works. <laughs> right. But then I think, man, this guy's life is uh, maybe ruined is, is a little dramatic, you know, because we've met, you know, Bobby Dino and others who have been to prison, and they're, you know, have, living good lives. But his life is certainly being taken in a different direction than he would yes. have liked. And so much of that is just it the, the, if you watch the video, you're like, this is a bad vibe. Just get away. So if I had been in that situation, I just would have left. Peace out. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have made a scene. I wouldn't be dramatic. I wouldn't have argued with them. I just would have said, okay, because I've been in situations where people kind of know that I fight. This is before I you know, was really about calling people out of my life. And knowing that I would fight would get them to kind of pop off. And I would just leave. I'm like, okay, I'm, I wouldn't make a scene. I would do you know, what they call Irish goodbye. I'm just out of here, bro. Bad right. vibe. Bad vibe. And they're, they're, everybody knows that. Everybody knows. Everybody listening to this knows you just get a vibe. You get a bad feeling about someone. Just yeah. walk away. But society conditions you not to do that. Oh, don't judge people. Duh, you got to give people chances. But what I can tell people is that of every major mistake in my life, I had a vibe about the person before that. I had a, something inside me said, get away, leave. Right. And I allowed the social conditioning of the simulation. Oh, don't judge people. You don't know. Give people a fair shot. I let that conditioning override my own internal operating instinct, and it, it led to some really catastrophic results in my life. Absolutely, and that's and that is that, that I found that as well. And, and a lot of times in in business, for me, is you know sometimes you want something to work, so you overlook some some red flags and things like that, and then you know, you get into business with somebody and it's not where it should be and it doesn't end well. And you can almost always trace that back to, you know, if I would have paid attention to X, if I wouldn't have, you know, pushed that off. And it's a constant learning thing. I make those mistakes even today. But, but that is part of that, that law of attraction of where if you're cognizant of everything that's happening around you and cognizant of this energy around you with different people, then, you know, person, uh, X isn't good, but person Y is, and then you put more energy on, on person Y, and then person Y, you find, you know, they have friends that maybe there's one or two of those people that resonate with you, and then all of a sudden, is this really law of attraction, or is it like just a compound effect of, of another good choice, another good choice, another good choice, whereas the guy with the gun, or the guy with the drugs, or whatever, hanging out with those people is bad choice, bad choice, bad choice. And you layer on more bad choices to the point where you're hitting rock bottom instead of going up into the sky. And, right. Uh, and that's why I don't get in the weeds of what is the law of attraction when people want to, because people, that's a bad vibe for me. If I'm like, oh yeah, I believe in the universe and you know, we got to get the energy out there. If you have a good vibe, you'll be like, yeah, you know, I feel you. We, we should be more positive or something. If your mm -hmm. first inclination is to say, well, what do you mean? Physics cares about you? Like people that on Twitter, I just block them. I, I'm like, right. okay, because, because I have a bad vibe from you. And I, sometimes I'll tease people and say, I bet you're left on red. And it always gets under the skin. Left on red is what the kids say because – if a girl has read receipts on her text messages, you can see that she read it. She's not replying. And that really, yeah, but I can tell because that's your first impulse. Whereas the vibe, a person with a good vibe will say, yeah, I mean, you know, it's not really the universe. It's not really physics. But, you know, Mike, what you're talking about is, you know, social relationships and social networks compound you become a node because you become a node more people are going to reach out to you on their own because you have more to offer so it's not really physics involved here but you got a point see that's true so it can simultaneously be true that the universe per se doesn't give a crap about you and that's all new age mumbo jumbo but it can also be true that if you embrace the universe as if your choices matter and you are connected energetically then you will, you will actually change your own lives. There was research, for example, that showed if people, it's like, it's a philosophical ethical debate. Maybe we'll, we'll link to the article or something, but if you convince a person they don't have free will, their life outcome is worse than if you convince them that they do have free will. And that's one of the many paradoxes. You're like, wait a minute, but 
how, how would that work if you don't have free will? Why would it matter? Well, because if you believe you have free will, you make better choices, you have a better life. But in the Western world, people aren't comfortable with Tao. They're not comfortable with paradoxes. So people say, well, but you know, there's always these like, it's a very male thing to you, where men are like, well, what you said there doesn't make any sense. It's contradictory and paradoxical. That's the Western mind. Right. And that's a great mindset to have when you're talking about um, financing and accounting. Um, if, you know, when it comes to a balance sheet, I don't want any woo woo kind of stuff here. I want very, very clear numbers and everything else. But right. conceptually about your own running software, you can, it's like the MC Escher diagrams, you can create a, a better loop, a better strange loop by changing the input. So me, I believe as if my choices matter. I believe and live as if I have free will. I live as if I'm connected energetically to the universe and that the energy that I send out to people is going to return to me. And moreover, that makes me feel like less of a victim when, when bad things befall me because I haven't always been the nicest person to people. So I don't ever self-pity because I go, well, yeah, I mean, energetically, I've sent out some, some negative energy in the past, you know, and a lot of what I'm dealing with now is, you know, rebalancing the karma and I need to be more focused on sending out positive energy. If you live that way, you will have better outcomes, whether it's because of some scientific law of attraction or whether that's just pseudoscience or whether that just becomes it's a great heuristic to um, live by is another thing. Well, and I think it's, it's, it seems quite obvious that maybe it is both. It's both physical action and then it's this maybe astrophysical, you know, reality that's, you know, out there. And those two combine or intertwine um, inside your life based on choices and actions that you take. And then, of course, you know, things that we can't see like energy and, you know, uh, you know, there's a level of consciousness that you could pick up on almost a lot of people say uh, like Donald Trump has this ability. Um, and there's been situations where I felt like I can almost like see what's going to happen in a situation, like a business situation. And somebody, you know, I'll have five guys that'll say, don't buy that property. Don't buy that property. Don't invest in that. That's, you know, really rough street or there's something to happen there. And I'll say, well, yeah, but I see like there's just a way to weave around this that maybe everybody else doesn't see. I know that almost seems like matrix, like, you know, dodging the bullet or something. Uh, but there is some, I've experienced at least that, that reality that sometimes you are able to see ahead of things that are coming at you and move sideways and even make pick up a, uh, for me, pick up a property that everybody has passed on and then make a huge profit on it. Um, and why is that? I don't know. You just, you're able to see that stuff sometimes if you're in tune with it. Yeah. It could be precognition. It could just be you manifest your reality because now you have skin in the game. It could just be, well, objectively that was a dumb choice, but I'm able to make this something great because now I'm going to really go all in on it. And that's right. why I mean, there's, there's multiple. And that's why I always block people who want to get really like fierce about the stuff and argue. I'm like, it could be either. We don't know. We know that we are energetic beings, though. We, you know, we all know that you've touched a person and felt the spark. We all know there's these metaphors. The first kiss, I felt fireworks or something. We all, know, we all know there's some kind of energetic nature to us. What that means, we don't fully know or even, I don't think we're even close to fully understanding it. But we are energetic beings. We do feel energy. Children feel energy. Dogs feel energy. Now, whether you want to take that and reason that out into some kind of really complicated law of the universe, I, I don't go there, but it's, it's certainly helpful to think that way. It's certainly helpful to live your life as if what you're meditating on matters. And, and again, I've noticed, I've just noticed it way too many times, especially the deeper I've gone into myself meditatively, the deeper I've gone into myself with Wim Hof kind of stuff. The I've had experiences now where like when I'm talking to somebody, it's like I'm not even engaged in that world. I've completely withdrawn inside my own self. There, there are all sorts of, there's a whole universe within. And that's what really disappoints me is I think the universe is both within and without. And you, the deeper you go within yourself, the more in tune you become with the universe without. And that's why you got to focus on your energy, your meditation, your Wim Hof breathing and focusing on the universe within. And this is really important, I think, for, for anyone listening to this is 
there, there's all types of activities that you can bring into your life to enhance this. I think what Mike's saying, and certainly what I'm saying is, there is, it's very much a real thing. You can draw things into your life. Mike and I aren't trying to explain if you know, the law of attraction is actually the law of attraction. I'm just telling you that there's things that happen in my life that, and, and, and it's happened, as it might you mentioned earlier, it's happened to me too many times to just discount it and say, well, that's not, that's not how it works because it does work that way. You can absolutely 100% draw things into your life. My feeling is, is that you have to layer and you have to compound that with multiple good life choices, right? I mean, if I go to the gym, I get the great physique, and then you get a beautiful girlfriend, okay? Did you, was that law of attraction or was that compounding these actions? And then this whole issue of energy and putting out the right energy, we all feel it. We all know it's there. And I think everybody in, in a way is searching, trying to find, you know, that, that right energy that they connect with. But be aware of it. Be cognizant that that is out there. And it'll help you make better social choices, but it'll also help you make exceptional business choices and really stop and think about that. Sometimes, you know, Mike mentions meditation. Stop and meditate on that. You know, if you're going into a business transaction, you know, and it's a, it's a larger transaction, there's nothing wrong with stepping back, getting some quiet time, going on a walk or whatever you do to kind of clear your head or clear your mind and really meditate or think about that particular deal and look at the ramifications of that going forward and how it's going to affect you, opportunity cost and things like that, because all those things are really, you know, it gets into this whole hippy dippy kind of stuff, but really stop and think about it. Because for me, you know, as a guy growing up in, you know, St. Louis, Missouri, you know, this stuff was really frowned upon, but I can tell you that there is a lot of validity to it. And it's not just a California thing. Anybody can, can apply this to their life and to their business. Yeah, not only that, but there, so there's physical. And then there is, again, people, if they would spend more time with themselves, they would, they would just feel the vibe. People, yeah would feel the vibe in ways that, that they don't now. You just walk around, there's a way people look. There's an aura about people that people have. And, you know, sometimes the, the people who have that aura are not necessarily good. Um, I've met people very charismatic, very shady. Also, I wouldn't have any, but you can feel their energy and you can, you can feel that vibe. But most men today are, you know, I'm sure this is most, you know, women too, but they're, they're just the walking dead. They don't have any energy or aura within themselves because they've let the social conditioning override their instinctual hardware. The instinctual hardware for a man is, and th this is, you know, a true story. They don't like to hear it. It is toxic masculinity. It is aggression. It is, I'm going to run shit. That's the way you think naturally if you're a man. Well, and sometimes, don't you sometimes see that even projected out, even when you're not with a person, you can see it projected out through social media or through film or, you know, through video, et cetera, that sometimes that, that aura or that energy is so strong that it literally captures you or you can feel it remotely. Well, I, no, I feel energy through the computer. Yeah, I can feel when, when somebody types and I'll read that. I'll feel like a little jolt and say, okay, this is a demonic person or this is a, you know, a demon is kind of a catch-all phrase that I mean for an entity of negative vibration. Mm -hmm. And, oh, I absolutely can feel it. That's why I block people so fast. I can't even understand it. Like, yeah. why, I'm like, well, why would I allow demons into my life, right? You're trying to, what people don't understand is when you're messaging me, you're trying to send energy to me. The energy is communicated via words. But it's just really, you're trying to make me feel a certain way. People don't understand that. Like when I write, I know when something is going to hit because I know how I felt when I wrote it. If I just da, 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 go do this, live your life, blah, 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 blah. And I don't feel anything. There's no soul into it. I know nothing's going to happen with that. But when I write with just rawness and vulnerability, here's what it was like. I was a fat kid bullied and I'm going through an emotional process and almost crying and wondering why I'm crying and what the, you know, what is even going on here? I, I'm like, okay, I know that that's what's going to hit because I'm sending my energy to the world and the medium is text, font, words, right? Because that's how I communicate with people. So. Right. 
when people write with me or write to me and I'm saying, okay, you've communicated negative vibrations to me via the written word, I just block them. And, and again, people, they don't get that. They, they don't understand that. And then they get more anger that I block them. They try to contact me. But really, that should be an intervention. They should say, wow, I'm sending out negative energy such that I, because it's an attention economy. I've blocked, you know, across all platforms, probably 20, 30,000 people. And in an attention economy, most people would be happy to have 20 or 30,000 people read them. So it's, it's like your energy is so negative that in an attention economy, I don't want you reading me. That, that should be for people to wake up call. But of course, because they are demonic or whatever we want to, where we want to use to describe them, they don't understand that. They don't see I, it that I, way. I think one of the most interesting people that I've seen that's projecting this energy right now um, is a gentleman by the name of uh, Cobra Tate, mm -hmm. who's uh, real big on Instagram. And uh, I don't know what his following is on Twitter, although I do read him there. But there is this divergence of energy. Uh, he puts out a certain level of energy, right? And there's these folks that are like, I guess it's the beta alpha side of that. But the way that he is triggering people, and this is like just over the past couple of weeks, I think some uh, podcast in the UK did a thing on him about him being an asshole and a womanizer and, you know, the typical ad hominem names about you know, whatever. And he took issue with that because it offended somebody that worked for him. And so he went and recorded a piece. And it seems like ever since then, over the past couple of weeks, we've just seen this real level of, I, I don't know, I mean, I, I watch him, I pick up on his energy. I, I dig it. I, he's a very interesting character. Um, and maybe you can give some insight on that too, because I, I think that you kind of watch what he's doing as well. Yeah, he's, he, we should actually, if you have time, we should do a podcast right after this one and just clip this one in like the rich guy podcast. So the Cobra Tate has set off a whole debate amongst a number of issues. And one is that he's one of the first people to, that actually has money, although he, he doesn't, I don't think he has net worth. We can talk about that and how that's a little bit different. So like you have more money, like way more than he would, but it, you don't consume it. So it looks different. But that said, he still has real money. I mean, if you buy a Lambo, you either have the two hundred thousand or you don't. Whether whether your net worth is two, whether your net worth is now declined twenty percent because you drove it off is a completely different issue. Right. But most of the guys here on the internet, they couldn't go buy a Lamborghini at all, so they feel threatened because they all talk about, oh yeah, online business and I'm doing e-commerce and I read the little stories and, I, and knowing what I know, I'm like, no, you're not doing that well. And one of my issues I have with a lot of the, the people who hate on the guy who hate on Cobra is like, if you, if you just came to me and said, Hey, I started an e-commerce store. I'm making like 50 grand a year and I live everywhere that I want in the world. I'd be like, bro, that's amazing. I wish when I was like 25, I could have made 50 grand on the internet. You know, I didn't know how to make 50 grand on the end when I was 35. Incredible. But instead they're all rich. Oh yeah. I have a seven. Cause they, they value their, the way they, the way they get away with lying to themselves is they, they give their companies these seven figure valuations. So they're doing say like 50 grand a year in revenue. And then they go, well, you know, I read that Tesla is valued at 20 times earnings, 50,000 times 20 is a million. Oh, Hey, I got, I have a seven figure e-commerce store. That's, that's how they know that really is the kind of global math they do. Okay. Oh my yeah. goodness. Yeah. yeah. So, but right. Cobra, Cobra, might be a good one let me let me stop right here for one right. second and let me do a josh cut this and then this will be the the end of the last one and where mike said clip we'll we'll start a new podcast there um but so mike this has been a great conversation about uh energy and law of attraction and things like that um uh, very interesting and as mike mentioned in the last podcast uh, three weeks from now, we're going to start doing these live and we're going to do them on uh, Facebook and probably YouTube or other major platforms. We haven't completely figured that out yet. And we're still doing a little bit of research on it. So we'll figure that out. But we are going to be going live with this in three weeks. And uh, just wanted to let you know that. And Mike, it was great talking to you as always. Always a pleasure, man. Yeah. Okay, Josh.
So you can cut that and then um, you can just bounce this piece back to the end of that one. And then we can pick it up on the, uh, on right. the so, so before we go, we're going to title this, how do rich guys really live? And it'll make sense. Just let me take the lead and, and it'll make sense. And this is going to be fun. It'll get clicks. It's a little dramatic. It's kind of fun, but it'll be. Okay. It'll... okay so you were just talking about um, the $50,000 guy and saying his business is worth a million dollars. So Josh, okay. so I, I think we just won't, I think we'll just delete that section not even okay. have it there. And that was, right. or we can clip that as like an outtake or whatever. We can just sure. say how, you know, how the internet hucksters get, get a, um, you know, why does every, let's, we'll, we'll just call that why everyone claims they have a seven figure company. And th that'll be, and then we'll just clip that as like a, um, we'll just clip that as, as that. Okay. You ready? You got it. Hey, Mike, good seeing you. Always a pleasure. Mike Cernovich, Cernovich.com. So today, well, we're going to have a fun conversation. A little bit drama, but we're not going to name names because I don't like to do drama. But there's this ongoing debate on how do rich people really live. And it's a funny debate because it's usually guys who are younger who always have to say, well, my rich friend does X, my rich friend does Y. And they're obviously you know, not rich themselves or whatever. So I'm just going to read something to you, something to you. And you can tell me if this is consistent with how quote unquote rich people live. Okay. The, the richest man I know doesn't even have a nice car or nice clothing. Funny how that works. What would you say to that? I would say that I've read the millionaire next door and I've read the millionaire mind. And I can tell you from being around many very wealthy people, I had an event uh, here at my uh, facility not too long ago, a couple weeks ago, uh, called Whiskey Talk. And I had a gentleman fly in from Romania, and uh, he owns apartment buildings in Berkeley, California, um, Albany, California, all kinds of massive real estate holdings. And... He owns a house on the ocean in Sicily, has a uh, incredible place in Romania. And do you know what kind of car he drives? What kind? A smart car. Well, your, your answer is different than mine, which is okay. and maybe because you're, you're, you're a little more diplomatic still because you knew the podcasting game. The, the richest guy I know, I, I know so many rich people that is crazy. The idea that rich people live like X, I think is kind of a silly thing that somebody who doesn't maybe have those things is telling himself so that he feels like he's like the rich people. I know rich people who, first of all, you would never know the rich, but I know rich people who enjoy every luxury, every car, every drug, every prostitute every sugar but everything that you could ever possibly imagine and 100%. i know and i know they enjoy kind of everything in between and the reason i brought up that tweet is there's this little it's all gossipy right now and it involves a, a kind of a former kickboxer cobra tate who's very ostentatious with displays of wealth and it seems to have made a lot of people jealous because they can't make those ostentatious wealth displays so they're trying to essentially say anybody who really has money doesn't display their money, but you have actually done well in life. And you know, a lot of people who you have a roadster, you had a Tesla roadster, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So oh, yeah, I, 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 I'm not going to be one to tell you, I don't, uh, I, I don't spend my money. I mean, I just sold a two and a half million dollar house here in Napa Valley. I've, you know, got fantastic cars. I own a Maserati, you know, whatever. Um, not everybody lives like that, that I, that I've encountered now. I can tell you that, you know, I've been down to Florida and spent time with some very wealthy folks down there that I know, you know, and they have fantastic yachts and huge houses and, and enjoy all the luxuries of life. But I also know some that don't do that. And so I don't want to say that you, I don't think it's possible to put them into a, um, into a box and say that every rich person does that because like I'm sitting here right now at my facility at the Napa airport. This is a pretty ostentatious place. It's a pretty ostentatious and um, 
uh, maybe self-indulgent to a, uh, a, you know, a little bit. I mean, I paid a lot for this and, you know, there's four of us that office out of here. Um, but you know, the guy next door, literally the guy next door to me has the same size facility as I have. And you know what he has it filled with? Porsche 911s. He rehabs and fixes up Porsche 911s and that's what he spends his money on. But <clears throat> you go up to his house here in Napa Valley, he lives in maybe an eight or $900,000 house, but he's got millions of dollars worth of cars next door. <laughs> so, you know, right. I think everybody does it differently. Um, there are some guys out there that spend it, but you get into the situation of, you know, are you the guy that made a quick, a quick lick on maybe Amazon reselling, you know, dog toys or something like that. And you made 800 grand and you go out and spend 600 grand on a McLaren. Well, I mean, okay, but what do you have left? Yeah. And, and that's the point I was driving at is the, there's kind of, a subculture of young men who have never had wealth themselves or been around wealth, but they always have want to have an opinion, right? Everybody yeah. know, Oh, this rich guy, you know, you know, first of all, you don't know how people really live. That's one of the things that I've learned in my, as I'm 41 years old now is the number of truths about like, first of all, most successful people have had a nervous breakdown of some kind or another. This is true. Yeah. Um, but you never read about that. Everybody lies, pretends it doesn't happen. It's like the dirty little secret. So the really rich guys, you know, you, you don't even know them unless you know them well, unless you've seen them have a heart attack. I took a, I took a, a friend of mine, 33 years old. He thought he was having a heart attack, right? Because that was, that was the pace he was on. Nobody, nobody ever talks about that kind of stuff. So, so the idea that these kids, they know what a rich person is and how they truly live. You, you never know, how, first of all, how anybody lives because – life is unconventional, but I, I think there's a lesson in terms of there's ways to acquire wealth if you're middle class, and then there's ways that you can spend wealth, and the ways that people spend wealth are completely diverse. I know a guy who lives in a $50 million house, but he won't buy anybody coffee because he's a cheap, cheap ass, right? And you would say, right. well, how can somebody with the $50 million home be a cheap ass? Oh, it's possible. <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> It's yeah. possible. Yeah. yeah. Well, and my, yeah, I was just talking about this guy that, that I'm friends with that, that lives in Romania. His place in Romania is fantastic. His place in Sicily is on the beach. And, you know, it's actually an apartment building that he purchased and then converted into a house with a couple guest homes. Okay. So he spends lavishly on certain things, but cars are not one of them, right? He doesn't go out. He doesn't drive a Lamborghini. He probably buy 50 Lamborghinis. Doesn't do that. Does he have a very nice house? Yes. Does he own, you know, uh, assets that generate, you know, income every day and every week and every year? Yes. Um, but he spends it in different ways. I mean, you know, we go to like, you know, the Barrett Jackson auction in Las Vegas, you know, and he gets the, the largest suite that they have at, at, you know, the Mandalay Bay and invites, you know, a handful of us to stay there. And we got a butler inside the place and, you know, we're, we're, he's picking up the tab for everybody. What's that end up costing him at the end of the day, 12 grand. And he had one hell of a three or four day weekend. That's completely worth it. But he still drives a smart car. <laughs> so I, you know, I don't know what to say. I mean, it's just people spend it in different ways and there's no universal fact that if you make X, you're going to buy the Lamborghini and then you're going to buy this and you're going to buy this. And by the way, he, he is married to a Romanian supermodel. So, I mean, this guy's got it all, but he spends it very quirky how he spends the money. Right. And that's where the, again, the debate so silly, the idea that rich people, everybody got rich the same way or everybody lives the same way that they are rich or that everybody spends money the same way. It's really absurd because it's not true. Like for me, when I did pretty, like me, I'm basically myself, I'm poor because when I started having a family, I put all my money in trust funds for my kids, for my daughters, right? So I don't even live, I don't even live like a rich guy. But that said, I define rich as I can do whatever I want to do. But what I want to do is not, I don't want to drive a Lamborghini. And that isn't sour grapes, right? I never, never said, oh, I'm going to go buy a Lamborghini today. I, I could, could have, I could go buy one. But it is about, to me, and this is what I think a lot of people who think deeply about money goes, it is about, can you do what you want to do? It's, and then you realize it's more about freedom 
and then you realize that a lot of what we spend our money on is servitude, slavery. People go, why? Well, I mean, I always say people, you know, if you like nice watches, I'm not judging anyone. People can like what they like. But a lot of the consumption we do is to signal to other people that we have money. One of the more influential books I read on that was uh, Spent by Jeffrey Miller, I think it's called. And the idea is, well, I want people to know I'm successful and I walk into a room. So therefore, I'm going to have the Patek Philippe watch or the, you know, the gold submarine or Rolex or whatever the case may be. And, and all I'm really doing is signaling to people or I'm going to drive that really expensive car to signal to women that, hey, I'm a good mate. So it becomes mate selection. But then you think, well, I mean, that car... $150,000 in LA, you can get a night with maximum level women, New York, any big city, you can get a night with maximum level women, $800. So if you just do the math, but you, you would say, well, I would actually have more, more results if I just went, <laughs> went to, but then people don't, but they don't want to have that self-honesty. They don't want to say, well, I'm driving this car because I want to impress people. Now that said, and again, this is why a lot of the debates are silly. There's no universality to it. I had a 2011 uh, BMW that was, you know, had a lot of things done to it that maybe shouldn't have been done. A lot of aftermarket parts and it was fun. And I enjoyed the heck out of that car. I miss it. And it was only a $33,000 car. What kind of car was that, Mike? 2011, um, 335 sport. You put an aftermarket intake, aftermarket intercooler. There's all kinds of ways you can tune it up. You get, there's Alpina coating chips. There's a lot of different things you can do. Sure. You can get it so it can run. But anyway, there are people who love driving a car and I actually love driving that car. Uh, the only reason I don't have it now is I have kids and, you know, so I have, I'm, I'm a minivan kind of guy, at least at this stage of my life. But there are people who they really love cars and that's cool. There are people who really love watches and that's cool. That said, people should be more honest with themselves. Yeah. Am, am I really doing this to impress other people? Am I doing this to manufacture a persona or am I doing this because it's really authentically me and what I want? And then you realize how do rich people really live? They live just like everyone else. They live in all kinds of different ways. Right. Yeah, there is no universality to it. What, what's your take on, you know, the way that Cobra Tate has gone out and been able to trigger so many people, uh, especially recently? Um, what's your take on that? I mean, he, he really has an ability to stir the pot when it comes to this, this question about wealth and how he approaches it. He's got an amazing energy about him when, when you watch him. Uh, on some of his streams or even, you know, on Instagram and he does these little clips while he's driving around or wherever he is. I, I find it fascinating just to watch the guy. And I think I forwarded to you a couple emails from him that just uh, completely blew my mind. I mean, he's just the way that he approaches this stuff, but what's your take on that on, on where he is right now at this point in time over the past couple of weeks? Right. So Cobra, Cobra Tate is triggering insecurity in men. And uh, Alexander Cortez did the same thing. He triggered in insecurities in men. And by that, if you are a man who just owns the douchebag factor, that triggers yes. people. Then in a way that doesn't trigger you or me, I'm like, oh, that's kind of funny. Looks like they're having fun. But to me, I view it that way because I've done that. I've lived that way. I've, I've sure. had the fun and everything. And if I wanted to live that way again, I could, but most men view that as unattainable. And what they don't realize is that, you know, we talked earlier in a podcast about the law of attraction. I'm a bigger believer in the law of reflection, which is that the way you feel about a situation says less about what you're looking at and it's a mirror onto you. So you see Cobra Tate and you go, what a douchebag. No, no, no. You see in yourself that you're physically inadequate. You see in yourself that you, you're not good looking and you're not taking care of your body. You see in yourself that you don't have that car and you can't go zipping down the mountains. You see in yourself those women that you, you know, oh, I would never want a woman like that, but yet they masturbate to porn to women who look like that, right? So it's just a completely dishonest and authentic engagement that they have when they see them and that's the mirror. And recognizing that is how you work on yourself. You say, okay, yeah, you're right. Ugh. 
I, I feel that. That's jealousy on my part. Okay, I'm, right. now I'm going to be honest with myself. I'm going to say, you know what? I wish that I looked that way or talked that way or had the women or had the other things. Now, the flip side to me is I've, what, I, I see all that and I'm like, I'm glad he's having fun, but he's going to get bored with it. And then sure enough, I see him tweeting earlier today that I'm giving up drinking. I'm tired of waking up hungover. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you're – it's fun. It's fun for, I always tell men, it's fun for about a year and a half at most. Usually about nine months is enough. And, right. and then it just becomes a recycled experience. But the, the broader point is people who, who look at that, they, they, are, they are feeling jealousy. Nothing triggers people like a confident man who can walk the walk. Even Muhammad Ali, they would call him arrogant. He said, ain't bragging if you can do it. There's really nothing. Like I, I had all this media articles about me because I wrote a fashion thread. And yeah. There's nothing, and, and, and their takedowns to me, they fail to admit, no, this is a tall, good-looking guy with a nice body, right? This isn't, I'm not pretending to be Tyson the supermodel or something like that. You know, I'm, I'm realistic, but this is objectively speaking. People look at me, and I'm an attractive man, and especially at the time I was even younger and even more better looking. So what they see, they're just triggered. They're triggered by a good-looking man. And I'm sure that's true too. Men get that way when they see a beautiful woman, uh, what a B-I, you know, T-C-H or whatever they think, because they want, it all goes back to Aesop's fable of sour grapes. They can't grab it. They can't reach up and grab it. So they say there must be some flaw with it. Where me, I just admit, yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I don't have that. Maybe I want that. Maybe I should, maybe I should look, look into myself a little bit about that. Right. That's that. And that's a great piece right there is that it, just being able to look at that and then realize, hey, what am I reflecting back on that? Right. What am I taking from that? Because if I am looking at that and saying, geez, that guy is such a douchebag or whatever. Well, maybe I need to stop and think and say, maybe that's where I am. How can I fix that piece of my mindset uh, to be a little bit different? But yeah, this whole wealth thing is is a interesting piece. And I it's fascinating how much uh, this character, uh, Cobra, has really triggered some of these uh, beta males out there. Um, uh, the vitriol and hate that's launched at him on Twitter is really, it, it's, well, it's entertaining to watch for sure. No, it's fun. And then there was media articles. There was, um, it was supposed to be, it was written in that very snarky, sarcastic style, which is, you know, because Andrew Tate had tweeted out that all the women, we're with him now. And then Barstool Sports, some, you know, schlub there writes an article. There are no women because Cobra Tate has them all. And it was ladled with sarcasm. But if you read it, you would, right. you would see, you're just so jealous of this guy. And then I posted that link to my Facebook and I got nothing but hate from, from my crowd, people who follow me. What is this? It was just triggering to people. And again, it goes back to the cargo shorts thing. It's all the same principle, which is a, a well put together, successful man who owns it. None of this false modesty. One thing you learn, one of the great lessons I learned from Benjamin Franklin's autobiography is that if you really want to do things in society, you have to self-deprecate because it triggers people. A, a man who just has it all together and owns it trigger people. Muhammad Ali did. It doesn't matter your race. Andrew's doing it. I've done it. Alexander Cortez did it. Jacob Wall's done it. It, tri it triggers people if you just own it. And one, one skill that I kind of had to learn is that's why when people meet me, they go, well, I didn't really, you're so big, right? Like in real life. Cause when I take pictures, I'm always leaning down and everything because you really do attract a, a violence towards you. If you just say, look, yeah, I'm here. I am dude. I'm big gorilla welcome to the party, have fun. People go crazy. And again, that's because of they feel diminished even when you don't diminish them. Just by being there, they are seeing their own image and it's reflecting back on them and they're recoiling in horror. Yeah. I do want to say one last thing about this, uh, about this whole wealth factor. And that's that I think that people really get caught up in some of the flash in, in, in wealth and, and, Certainly, there is a place for that, and there's nothing wrong with enjoying the uh, rewards of, of your hard work. The reality is, and the studies show this, and, and I can certainly link to them um, on our podcast here, but the studies show that the vast majority of multimillionaires 
in the United States are blue collar millionaires. They're not the ostentatious, flashy type. Now that doesn't mean that there's not a piece of their life that they are very ostentatious with. I mean, maybe the guy's really into dirt bikes and four wheelers and he's got, you know, uh, three Polaris that, you know, those things are 30 grand a piece and he's got a bunch of four wheelers and he's got a farm that's 1200 acres in Montana that he has, you know, bison on and he rides his, his, you know, four wheelers out there. So there might be a piece of their life where they really pour money into or, or maybe uh, uh, lavishly spend, but, the data and the reality is, is that the vast majority of multimillionaires, at least in the United States, are not ostentatious, but they're more of the blue collar millionaire type. Yeah. The, and again, the millionaire next door is a great book to read on that because the difference between say like Cobra and Andrew and you know, the, the blue collar millionaire is say you saving, having a million dollars is different than spending it. So yeah. if you, if you have a million dollars, and you're, even if you wanted to get yield off it or whatever, you'd be lucky if you could get, kick off 80 grand in cash flow off the million. You'd be lucky if you, if you levered up, got some prop, maybe. So you're really only making 80,000 a year, even if you're a millionaire. But if you, you know, some guys get a million dollars and they buy three or four cars and that looks rich to people. People go, yeah. that looks rich. And then there are people with 50 million who buy those cars and it looks rich to them. So if, if you have two Lamborghinis, to the, the most men who don't know much about this kind of stuff, that looks as rich as a 50 millionaire. Even if the person was only a 500,000 heir and they spent all their money on cars. And I'm not saying that that applies to Andrew or whatever, but that's, that's what really bothers people. So yeah, this idea that rich people are X, it's absurd. I've known, I, I mean, I'm not going to name drop, but I know plenty of people who are, have extreme net worth and there's no way you could classify them as X. They're completely different. Some of them are total beta cowards who voted for Trump and they're terrified people find out even though there were $200 million and what really can they do to you? Other people are completely, they own it. They own their wealth. They're outspoken. They go by their things. Other guys are t live in terror of their wives, completely henpacked to home. Others are complete, you know, they have open relationships, every kind of variety of a person. And, and that I think is makes it interesting, but how do they get rich? And you should, I should do a podcast on that. There is something that people have in common on how everybody got rich, how they live when they're rich. That's different. And I think that's a good way to end the podcast. Yes, it is. Uh, another great episode, Mike. And, uh, you know, thanks for, uh, for hanging out again. And, uh, oh, a pleasure. Say, yeah. And, uh, if you can clip this for one sec, Josh, uh, Mike, maybe on this one, because now we're at, we'll say two weeks. So you want to do the, we'll go back and forth. We want to do say, hey. No, just launch them. No, no, just launch them both. Um, just launch them both. Oh, okay. No, All no, right. we should be, yeah, no, it's better. Yeah, we'll just launch them. Uh, yeah, we'll just, la just launch them both. And ideally, you know, as you get better and you're getting better, ideally we do three episodes a week. And well, I'd sure. rather do three episodes, 20 minutes than one episode, 45. So okay. as I figure out your vibe and your speed, that's when I realize, yeah. okay, well, this is a good conversation rather than say we have our episode wrap it and say, okay, let's just clip that. And then yeah. we'll do this one. And we had two, we probably could have done a third one. How do people get rich? But you know, so that's how you want to kind of think of this conversation in your own mind. If you go, yeah, this is a pretty, this is a good 20 minute convo just call the audible we'll clip it and then we'll we'll start it and then go in a different direction and i wonder if cobra tate's going to come after us now <laughs> oh he'll love it he'll love it because we're very nice to him we're very complimentary of him yeah that's true that's true um okay so i'll send uh 